In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions from listeners just like you. What they do is they go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They post the question under the qua meme. And we respond. And uh, we pick our favorite ones, and then we answer them on episodes like this one. Now, the way we open the episode is with our introductory conversation. This is where we talk about ourselves. We talk about studies, fitness, and random stuff. So here's what we had to talk about, what we did talk about in this episode. We start out by talking about my academic post. I did a, a, a poked at the PhDs and academics out there a little you bit. You rouser. Yeah, see what happened. Then we talked about how excited we are to meet Arthur C. Brooks uh, this week. We're going to go down to LA and interview him. He is the maker of the documentary, The Pursuit. It's in Netflix. I talked about music and its influence on workouts. Music has a massive influence on your motivation and the quality of your workouts. We talked about the history of Starbucks and Red Bull. Um, yeah, we talked about fun fact, bull come. We talked about <laughs> one of our sponsors, Viori, and their insane return policy. So check this out. Viori is one of the top makers of high quality athleisure wear clothes. But here's their re return policy: bring it back whenever. There's no time limit. You can bring your clothes back whenever, and you'll get store credit. That's how high quality they are. Now, Viori is one of our sponsors. Here's how you can get a discount. Go to Viori Clothing. That's V U O R I clothing.com forward slash mind pump. And you can get 25% off by using the code that is listed on the webpage. Yeah. Then we talked about the differences between men and women. I talked about heritage pork versus regular pork. Uh, by the way, one of our sponsors, Butcher Box, they're the, they take uh, grass fed meats um, and they deliver heritage pork to your door, so they have the, the, the highest quality stuff. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you can get massive discounts, including the ultimate steak sampler offer, which is two New York steaks, uh, four top sirloins, two filet mignons, all free in your first order, plus $20 off. 100% I'm doing that, Sal. That's right. Uh, we talked about the Epstein update. Uh, two of the uh, guards that were supposed to watch him are getting indicted. That's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. We talked about panspermia um, and barstool sports, rough and rowdy, uh, this amateur fighting. Then we got into the questions. The first question was, this person wants to know how long you should stay in a specific rep range. So is there a time frame? Next question, this person wants to know all about bulking and cutting. Like what is that all about? And can you build muscle while cutting calories? The next question, what's the best way to strengthen wrists. So if you have wrist pain or you just have weak wrists, good part of the episode. Yeah. And the the final question was uh, if we could prescribe one physical activity to people to be done two to three times a week, what would that be? Also this Jumping month, jacks. MAPS Performance is half off. Now MAPS Performance is our workout program, all planned out for you by the way. There's workout videos, blueprints, instructions, uh, this workout program is all about functional strength, athletic performance, fat loss, and muscle building. It can all be done in a gym. The workouts are fun and different. You will improve your mobility and your ability to do foundational movements like squatting, overhead pressing, twisting, moving laterally. Uh, you name it, it's in MAPS Performance. Again, it's half off. Here's what you do. Go to mapsgreen.com and use the code GREEN50. G R E E N five zero no space for the discount. You guys should see Italians talk on the phone. Old Italians talk on the phone, yelling at each other. How do they do it with? I just, think you know one hand. I think that <laughs> you only you know you can you can speak Italian with one hand. Yeah, Italians talk. Old Italians talking on the phone. I think they think they have to yell because the person's far away. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's hey, like, how you doing? Uh, yeah. Hey, let's go. I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, dad. Fucking technology is yeah. good now. Yeah, you don't have to yell out your window. Anymore. Yeah, there's yeah. no need to be that loud. Hey, talk to your grandma. I'm like, ma, stop. <laughs> God, blowing my ears out. Then yeah. I get on the phone. I do the same thing. Yeah, as I say, I do the. I have a bad habit of talking loud like that. I was just somewhere. Somebody was shushing me. <laughs> don't fucking shush me. You are loud too, <laughs> though. I am, I am loud. You're yeah, not as loud as terrible I am. Though. At that, probably not. Yeah. I'm totally like, yeah, in, yeah. inconspicuous. If you. I Come to dinner at my family's house. So poor Jessica. She's because she's not a loud person. She's quiet, right? Yeah. So she'll come to she'll come to my family functions, and we're all sitting around having conversations. And she'll 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 say something to like add to the conversation, and uh, 
and nobody, nobody picks up on acknowledges it, it because nobody no. heard her. Oh, no, <laughs> because they're all yelling, and yeah. I can see that she's you know she's like oh man you know. Like, so oh. then I'll say what she said. Oh hey, Jessica said that you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> you got to repeat it like that. Yeah, <laughs> That's hella funny. I told you gotta her, get her a megaphone. I told her I said it's like if if it's like when you're driving, you know, you put your blinker on to to tr- you, my family doesn't work that way. Don't put your blinker on, just get in. Just yeah. get it. Or you're yeah. not going to get jump it. It's like the moving car, you just got to run and then fucking get in. So me and my siblings were all like that uh, except for my youngest. My youngest sister is uh she's uh quiet. And so she oftentimes just sits there and the rest of us fight over who's Getting airspace, you know what I mean, with the, with the conversation. <laughs> it's so that fucked explains up. a lot. Uh, mean, speaking of fighting, I see you were picking fights on Instagram yesterday again. Nobody, nobody, nobody yeah, wanted could to. You just poking bears. Nobody wanted this, yeah. these hands. Oh, man. <laughs> 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 these hands. Nobody wanted these hands, dude. No, you know what it is. I, you know, there's a few things that just, you know. Chat my what no, do they say? Yeah. You and I are similar in this. Chat area my bum for sure. or what do they say? Chat my hide. Something uh, like that. I don't know. Whatever. Uh just grinds my gears, Grind pisses me, me off. Yeah. 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 And uh, one of them, there's two things. One is Roast my tomatoes. Is <laughs> morons, people who say things that are just totally terrible and wrong. And then the other one that actually probably irritates me more because I feel like they should know better, but of course they don't. These are the PhDs, academics, the scholars. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots and lots of education uh, who have zero experience working with people or training people. Um, Everyday average people. Or maybe they have some experience, but they're the the population they work with is this real narrow, like only high-level power lifter. Or just the, the, the gap is massive. It's eight plus years of heavy education, one year of training people. Yeah, and, you know? w- and what they do is they, they'll communicate this information, but they're really... All, they're just a little bit better than Google. You know what I mean? Mm. Like it, the the reason why people don't um, lead healthy and fit lives is not for lack of information. I hate to break this to you, smart people. It's not the problem. We live in the age of information. Right. The problem is it's not being communicated effectively. And what you learn when you when you train people through the years is not so much the information that's important. It's Knowing what to communicate, that's very important. Like if I say, I used to do this when I'd sit down in front of a client when I first became a trainer, I'd try and teach them everything in the yeah. first session. Yeah, yeah. And it would, it was incredibly ineffective. It would blow them out of the water. All driven it, by your own insecurities. Totally. Of mm-hmm. wanting to prove to them that you're smart. That I know everything. That's yeah. what I, so that's what I smell when I see that. Like when I yeah. see that, it's like you asserting yourself on Instagram like that. All you're trying to do is convince everybody how smart you are. The real desired outcome should be to help these people because that's the how you're trying to package this. But in reality, all you end up doing mm-hmm. is paralyzing most people because now they're like, well, fuck, I don't know if this well, is a good thing. Now I'm even or a- more confused. Right. So here's, I'll give you a, a, a great example, okay? So a while ago, the term adrenal fatigue was thrown around quite a bit mm-hmm. by health practitioners who'd been working, people with a lot of experience working with uh, clients. Now, adrenal fatigue, I'm putting in quotes um, because that's not really what's happening, but I'm putting in quotes, is the accumulation of all these common symptoms that practitioners have been noticing for a while in people's excess fatigue, intolerance to cold and heat, uh, just lots and lots of, you know, difficulty gaining, losing weight, holding water, you know, symptoms of hormone imbalances, you know, that that kind of stuff. Just huge, just these symptoms that all tended to come as one package, and they, they would call it adrenal fatigue. Then you have the the academics, the scholars and PhDs with their, you know, their 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 knight armor showing up. Ha, ha, excuse me. Their lab coats. Yeah. Adrenal fatigue does not exist. The adrenals do not get fatigued. And then they, you know, walk away as if they helped everybody. Reality is they hurt they hurt people because although the health practitioners gave it a name, that may not be accurate in terms of what's actually happening. The symptoms were there. Right. Mm-hmm. And the solutions that the practitioners were providing, which was more rest, stress, uh, you know, stress management, resistance training, a diet that's, you know, uh, particular to the individual in terms of, you know, more nourishing, less heavily processed foods, particular supplements that are, you know, adaptogens like ashwagandha. The 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 prescriptions were working for the symptoms, yeah. but then the academics came in and said, ah, oh, adrenal fatigue, the adrenals aren't getting fatigued, and it just made a bunch of people 
not get the help that Meanwhile, was Meanwhile, they're trying them. to really define and articulate better a real problem that exists, and they they noticed it. It just might not have been under the, the right labeling that, that they prefer. Correct. Here's a, another great example, right? Uh, foam rolling. Foam rolling um, it does help with range of motion. It does help alleviate pain, uh, in many cases temporarily, but it can be part of a, of a, of a program that actually – cures the root cause of pain because it encourages better movement. Foam rolling has a place, but they used to call it myofascial release. Right. Then the academics came out, oh, you can't release fascia. Fascia's too tight. Blah, 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 You're blah, You're stupid. Blah. So then a bunch of people like, oh, I guess foam rolling yeah. isn't good. No, right. no, no. It's still good. It's just they got tied up and caught up in showing everybody how smart they are. In reality, they are hurting a bunch of people and not helping anybody. This irritates the fucking shit <laughs> out it, of it me. It is frustrating. Yeah, man. priming isn't. Pri- you're not priming the muscle. You know, oh, studies show that muscles don't get more active when you prime. Well, fuck you, because we, maybe that's true. But we, we we get the same thing with that when you talk about like a sleepy butt or a neurological exactly. disconnect. Like then you get this big argument. There's nothing disconnected. There, you're still connected there. It's not miss, sleep. Miss the picture. Right. Completely miss the point of what you're trying to to teach a client. And it is, it's one, it's my biggest pet peeve. And we see it, uh, I see it more and more today because having uh, clickbaity, uh, you know, titles or alarming type of posts like that is what gets traction and attention. And so you can't just come out and give like good, sage, plain old advice. It was like, uh, I just gave that Friday fitness tip and I had some trainer kid come on there. And uh, it was a basic tip to help somebody who, I mean, I, this and this where this tip came from is, you know, thinking back to the hundreds of clients that I've watched do this, where they're doing bicep curls, they have a dominant side naturally that's stronger, they're right-handed, right? Their whole life they've been playing sports right-handed, and so they're just stronger on the right side than their left side. They do curls, and what do they do? They the, start with the right. Yeah, or, they, or, they, or they do a fuller final rep on the right side or do more repetitions with the side that is dominant because they can do more. Or the one on the left side, they try and catch up to the right side and they do this shitty form where they cheat up the last rep or two. So, you know, a tip that helped hundreds of people that I've trained with that is just t- teaching them to do unilateral movements, so one arm or one leg at a time, focusing first on the weaker side. So start with the less dominant side. As soon as form starts to break down, whether that's at four and a half reps or seven or eight, you stop right there. And then you mirror that with the dominant side. That's it. That's it. Brilliant. It's a very mm-hmm. simple fucking tip. And then you get a trainer who comes on there that wants to debate me about asymmetry. And it's like, you know, what is your desired outcome right now? Is it to... I think his desired outcome was to show how smart he is. Right, it, exactly. And Congratulations. I, and, I, and I called that out because it is it is a, a, a pet peeve of mine, and it was with even the trainers that I, I managed for so many years, is, you know, you work real hard to get these certifications, you work real hard to get this education, and I, I guess there's there's a part of you, and by the way, this is your ego and your insecurities that, that drives you to do this, that you want to show that. You want to show, oh, I, I know uh, this, and the, it's more technical and, and difficult than that, and you want to go deeper. But the reality is that the majority of people, that doesn't help them. They end up getting lost in the weeds. And most people are too insecure to admit they don't understand what you're saying, so they just shut up and they don't say anything. And then what ends up happening is nothing. Nothing gets accomplished. Mm-hmm. You come across like this fucking super smart trainer because you use all these terms that lose these people, that people feel uh, insecure that they, they don't want to admit they don't know what you're talking about, so they just kind of politely nod their head. Meanwhile, they don't change any of their behaviors and nothing gets accomplished. That's it. Like, what is your goal? Is your goal to help people, to really, really help people? Well, then how you deliver the information and choosing which information to deliver is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. And one of the biggest problems that you know these these influencers make with all this education and very little experience working with anyone is just hammering people with all this jargon and information that is almost completely worthless. Which is what I put in the post. I said that these PhDs and academics with little to no experience training people like you are slightly better than worthless. And what I mean by slightly better is it's like Google, except you don't need to enter in the search term they're telling you. So it's like Google. All right, good job. You did a great job. It's really good information. <laughs> and But but nobody wants- I'm insulted. I, I, I thought I would get a lot of pissed off people, which is fine. 
Um, but yeah, nobody, nobody uh, stepped. Nobody wanted. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted. Well, <laughs> nobody wanted none of this. It's, <laughs> it's, true. <laughs> it's true. Hey, speaking of cool information, I'm excited that we're we're heading down south tomorrow to go uh, listen to Arthur Brooks with uh, Bishop Barron. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm pumped about I'm that. I'm super excited. So I guess this too. is like an event or something. From what I gather, uh, Bishop Barron is putting together these talks where he's introducing other speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and one of these speakers is Arthur C. Brooks. He's a, an economist um, who, if you go on Netflix, you can watch the documentary The Pursuit, which I thought was a brilliant Super well made, very very well made yeah. documentary. He approaches uh, the the economic issues like what works better, markets or planned societies, or you know, from a very humanitarian standpoint, um, from an empathetic standpoint. I think he communicates it very very well. I'm so excited to to meet this guy and talk to him. Like I watched the documentary, and I was like, we need to get this. It's so weird how things work out. Too, we were down there interviewing Bishop Barron. Mm -hmm. Tell him that. You, oh no what happened was I was on their podcast and they asked me what my hobbies were and I said economics and they and they said oh that's weird because we're going to have Arthur Brooks yeah. I'm like you're kidding and I, we were already, we're homies we were already like, in contact what? with them yeah. yeah and so it was like it worked out uh, super and they're so generous to let us use their uh, their studio which it feels kind of cool yeah, you know, yeah. Th that they're doing that but he seems like a really smart cool guy so I want to go down and I, I, I want to ask him like hard questions that you know, maybe the audience may be thinking, you know what I mean? So yeah. Just kind of see how he. No, no, I'm excited. How he answers them or whatever. Time. Yeah. Anyway, this morning, um, so funny, dude. It, it's so funny all the focus that we place on all these weird products and supplements and things to help boost our workout performance and our pumps and and th probably the most powerful thing that I know of. And this actually s studies support this, but. I've also experienced music. Oh, I thought you were gonna say drinking water. No, yeah. yeah, well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> you gotta drink that water. is important. Yeah. yeah, dude, music, music yeah. makes that such a huge. It's funny too. We've known this. Uh, humans have known this for a long time. And, like, and what I wonder about that is it uh, so much music? And I would argue that it's more just mindset. Like, just what music does is it. I totally. think it puts you in the mindset of being hyper-focused on what you're doing, right? It kind of drowns out other distractions of your day and thoughts that you were having about, my got to get my kids to school. Oh, I've got this thing with this bank thing. Oh, i got this thing with work. And you got all this shit on your mind. And then all of a sudden, your favorite song comes in yeah. and you fall into the song. And I think it's more that than it is like music has something magical about well, that's it. The, and it's also like you're going through your list and you're finding those songs that you got the best reaction from. You know, so like I know... Uh, Based off of what kind of intensity I'm going in with my workouts, I'm like already like like finding those songs and putting it in my playlist, and I want to hit those at certain times, and it's it's so effective, man. It, it, like it totally works. Does anything and think about it? Does any anything invoke emotion as easily as music, or at least uh, not just as easily, but something that you can put on the background and do other things? I can't think of anything. Hmm. Music can invoke. Tears, like you ever hear a song that makes it moves you, yeah. or you hear a song that makes you hyper or calm, um, happy or sad, even like angry. Music has it, <laughs> and so this morning I was working out, and I totally went in with the intention. I'm like, okay, you know, I had two injuries over the past couple of weeks, minor, but I'm like, I'm going to go to the gym, and I'm going to work. I'm going to go light. I'm going to squeeze. I'm going to get a good pump. I'm going to be controlled. And then I just picked the wrong music. I put death metal on, <laughs> dude, and all that shit went out yeah, the window. Bad dude. move there. It was yeah. bad. Bro, I started with lightweight. I could do it though. Freaking you know, Lamb of God came on, and I'm just like, <laughs> I, I'm adding. You're in ninety nine. He's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Deathlock comes Folding on. In I'm, half. Like, I'm yeah. adding more. Uh, I mean, I have my my Spotify. You know. Uh, it's separated by genres, and there's just uh, there's certain genres I know better than to turn on when I know I need to go to the gym with that mindset. If I know I need to go with this more like recuperative type of training, I just I can't be in the heavy metal section. Yeah, you gotta I'm avoid just, it. Yeah, it's hip hop or fucking country if that's the case. Yeah, it's like, dude. that will keep me chill. You know what I'm saying? If yeah. I put something on that gets me all hyped, it's real hard. All to, my logic went out the window, yeah. and it just became now I'm in I'm at war with the weights, bro. <laughs> I'm at war, you know, battling. I, but you I, did have a good workout though. Didn't I you? did because I didn't hurt myself. You know, yeah. I was done. I was like, yep, yeah, thank you for. That's funny. Speaking of what, so like this morning I was getting my my first coffee, 
and I went into Starbucks and I had this really awkward moment where I used to go to Pete's a lot, right? And I like they know me by face, they know my order, they know all that stuff. And one of the the baristas from there, like the manager even, was in the Starbucks ordering like right after me. And I looked back and looked at, and then we both had this moment like I was like, "What are you doing here?" Yeah, and he's like, "Well, I'd like Starbucks." And I'm like, "Is that allowed?" Oh, bro, he was from. He's from Pete's. Oh, yeah, he's like wow. the Pete's manager. And I was like, "This is so weird," you know. Like, I've had, I've had things like that where somebody's wearing a shirt that's like the opposing, you know, company, and I don't know. It just it created this weird, awkward moment. <laughs> we both kind of just shuffled away like from you, each other. It's like you see one of those those trucks that says Coke on it, and they're delivering Cokes. And the guy's drinking a Pepsi. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what's that? Yeah, you're like you traitor. Yeah, yeah. dude. Pe- uh, 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 Pete's has better. Generally, their coffees are better. Yeah, but I love the flavor. Starbucks, of Pete's. their nitro crushes. I mean, that's what they have. Like, come on, Pete's. Well, you know, that Star- get on board. What, what Starbucks did so well is the you know it's like uh, the McDonald's thing where their consistency, right? You mm-hmm. know that, right? So they they burn their coffee at a, at a certain temperature, so it's always so, the same. Yeah, so it's always the same versus. You know, batches of beans being different, which is how coffee normally should be. Homogenized coffee. Right. It should normally be kind of like different at every Mm -hmm. batch. You get a a, a batch of beans that were grew on one grew on one side versus the other side or came out two weeks earlier or later. There should be some sort of a difference. But because they burn them, they burn them to a point where it's like it keeps the the flavor consistent. And I think what makes people so attracted to that is that because you've been trained to like exactly that. And and we we tend to gravitate towards those things that are normal and we're used to, and yeah. so it's like a consistent ritual. Well, you have. Starbucks is yeah. uh, espresso is terrible. Oh, it's, it's fucking awful, dude. Oh, they have the worst Ugh. espresso. It tastes like it's they taste burnt. Yeah, they need to add a, a shit ton of syrup to everything just to make it go down. Yeah, but you know, weren't the founders of Starbucks and Pete's partners? Yeah, I think yeah, I think uh, they they really? branched off and created Pete's. Yeah. They were they were partners. And I believe one of the partners wanted to stop selling. Uh, yeah, they were related at one point, like wow. like related, like blood think, related, or well, related think, like they were. I don't know all the details, but Howard Schultz ended up buying at least the the Starbucks up in Seattle, which was a break off from the same people who started Pete's. Hmm. Wow. Oh, interesting. And it, I think it reminds they, me of too. You remember uh, Home Depot? Like uh, Lowe's actually is a, is a spinoff of that. Uh, I guess it was the divorced wife created uh, Lowe's. Uh, fact check me on that, Doug. But that was another like interesting thing. Dude, like, like the same thing. I don't I, know how I would do with that. Like, because I'm such a competitive person anyway. It'd yeah. be like one of you guys leaving and starting another <laughs> fitness <laughs> another, podcast. Another mind strength. Yeah, my whole. Yeah. Like, I'd be like, I'm gonna <laughs> fucking <laughs> crush. Yeah. I already, I already thought about, that, about this. Yeah, so. pump mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pump mine. <laughs> yeah. Something <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, oh, we're gonna crush him. You know. Yeah. But I believe yeah. that they had different ideas of. Uh, how coffee should be made, what they should sell, or something like that, and so that's why Pete's and Starbucks have such a different feel. Like I feel like Pete's is a little bit more stronger. Not just that, but it's more of like more the like hipster. Yeah, like yeah. The, like they're a little bit more hipster with their coffee. Uh, where yeah, Starbucks like is a little more stuff. hipster yeah. with their coffee. What the <laughs> you know, fuck does that mean? A little more man buns thrown through. They don't there, know how to change I mean? tires. What yeah. the fuck does that mean? <laughs> exactly. They, like, like more they wear flannels, coffee. but they don't chop wood. Like they yeah. try to stay yeah. more true to the to like coffee. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the, the deal. Yeah. Do you know that all started right? Uh-uh. The, the founders went to um, uh, Italy and saw just how Italians loved all the different coffees that they drank and everything. Oh, yeah. And at the time, people laughed at him for, for even pitching that in America because Americans were like, we just like our drip, you know, our, our, our regular coffee. No one's going to spend five bucks on a coffee. So, so Doug, Doug just pulled it up. It's actually Pete's who owned Starbucks originally. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, isn't that oh, cool? I didn't know that. That's so, and, and I'm assuming oh. Howard Schultz came in and was probably so the, they started the mar- Pete's and then spinned off with Starbucks. Yeah, and saying? I'm assuming that he was like the marketing. Yeah, genius. Yeah, it was Howard Schultz who went to Italy and saw what they were doing over there, and he oh. had this idea. And I don't think anybody else was on board with it, so he ended up buying it. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of interesting story. Apparently, Bill Gates's father got involved with the purchase of that uh, from from the the, the Pete's guys because some very wealthy person in Seattle was going to buy the Starbucks out from under Howard Schultz. And Schultz had just kind of cobbled together as many assets as he could to buy it. And so somehow Bill Gates' father, Bill Gates Sr., who's an attorney, knew this rich guy and said, hey, this guy Howard really wants to buy this. Can you step aside? 
And so apparently that's how he got Starbucks originally. Wow, you know, and that makes uh, me want to read. I almost bought that book like five different times when I was in Barnes and Noble. I should I should read it now. Yeah, those are always cool stories. I actually have one that I don't know. I'm definitely gonna have to fact check me on this one, Doug. Uh, like in terms of like Red Bull's origin story and like how they're out, you know, uh, somewhere in like the eastern part of Europe, and uh, they they came across this this energy drink or whatever these people are drinking, and somebody said that that one of the ingredients is like taurine, and so taurine yeah. they're saying is like part of like it's like bull cum yeah bull semen i've heard that so yeah it's an amino acid people so funny about that okay so So it's like it's not that they're like mixing bull cum in their in their no morning drink no no dude (laughs) maybe maybe Uh, bull jizz has amino acids in it i'm sure it probably does i mean because people do some weird shit but that's where they got the name red bull then from huh probably maybe taurine that's actually from uh, thailand Thailand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thailand. Okay. So, have you guys ever had re- the the like it's okay? What the uncarbonated Thai version of Red Bull? No. Have you ever had this? No. So they're sold. So I used when I used to manage uh, the twenty four on Hillsdale. One of my trainers, Mike Swick, who ended up becoming a, a, a UFC, UFC guy. guy. Yeah, and he actually like, has gyms over in Thailand. Right? He does. Right. He's got gyms in Thailand. Great, super smart dude. Love that guy. Super cool, humble guy. Great fighter too. I think at one point he was ranked number two or three in, in, in his weight class in the UFC. Anyway, he was a trainer that worked for me. So I hired him. He comes in. He used to train across the street at AKA because you know, yeah. they're, they're across the street. And that's before, that's when he started getting into jiu-jitsu, but he'd always been doing uh, Muay Thai. And so he would come and talk to the fitness manager about, you know, my fitness manager about going and taking time off to go train in Thailand. My FM came to me and asked me, you know, what do you think about that? Is that cool? And I liked Mike. He was a great trainer. He wasn't one of the top producers, but he was good. And so I said, yeah, that's not a problem. And so Mike would leave for two weeks at a time or whatever to go train Muay Thai. Well, Mike was really grateful that, you know, we let him do that and, you know, whatever. So he came back and he brought me this like little like pack of these glass bottles. They were about this big. So they're like this big. And they were Red Bull. It was all Thai writing, and it was there was no carbonation. Was it their branding on it and everything? Oh, it wow. was Red Bull. Oh wow, really? And it was no carbonation. It was kind of syrupy and sweet or whatever. Yeah. And it was strong as fuck. Huh? Like you drink that, and you were just like, Rah! did so it just taste like cough syrup or what? It tasted just like Red Bull, no Which carbonation. Just, no, that's so weird. And it was a little bit, maybe a little more concentrated or whatever. Yeah. So every time he'd go to Thailand, he'd come back and he'd bring me this pack of these little <laughs> glass, you know, Red Bull drinks Probably or whatever. Super strong, huh? They were super strong. Dude. Yeah. They were on fire. And that's how I first started drinking. Interesting. Isn't that funny? Yeah, that I is. And that. they were very connected. Red Bull in Thailand was connected to the. The tie fighting uh, mm-hmm. space. That was I've like seen a big, it on a lot of the shorts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was like a big thing about them. You know, anyway. I have something interesting that Rachel told me uh, a couple days ago that I didn't even know. So I have, you know, my my favorite Viore pants that I have. The, there's the this, this zipper on the side of them. Yeah. And the seam on one of them from probably because my legs are getting so massive, they started oh. to <laughs> yeah. separate a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weird. Am I small or something? <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, so, squat so, so much. So they tried to se- they started to separate. I was like, oh man. I, and I was in the office and I was I was kind of venting to her. This sucks. This is the first piece of Viore anything that I've had that uh, something's been a, you know default or torn or had a problem with. And she's like, well, just send it back to them. They'll give you a brand new pair. And I'm like. What do you mean they'll just give me a brand new pair? She's like, yeah, you don't know that they have their setup like Nordstrom's. You guys know that? That like you, if you have issues with any of their, any of their clothing. Doesn't matter how long ago you bought it. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? What? So yeah, they're like Nordstrom's. Bro. Wow. So I didn't, I didn't even know that. I I was like, I've been fucking walking around with this fucking thing (laughs) fucked up for like at least three weeks. So I looked into it because I had a a tear in one of my sleeves. It might've been caused by me. I'm not, I'm I'm, I'm, your forearm workouts. We get it. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Just keep talking about it. Same thing. You know, Adam, I know what you're talking about, (laughs) but if it's weird, I'm out of that loop. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Justin's clothes never (laughs) ripped. My ass is like, yeah, but bursting at the seam. (laughs) (laughs) We always got to throw that in. Yeah. Um, if it's before 60 days, then you can get money back. If it's after 60 days, it doesn't matter how long after store credit. Yeah. It's dope. I know. Yeah. I know. I think that's a, do you, think that's a good move or a bad move well i think it's like we are with our programs yeah. i mean I, there's well, not, they are a high they know that they're quality yeah, right. i think that's what it is and it's like yeah you every now and then you're gonna get an, an example like that so it'll be very few examples where mm-hmm. you know the clothes might like have something you know defect but they're like okay we'll give you a better one mm-hmm. yeah that's mm-hmm. great yeah, yeah. Hilarious. i think when you i think when you know you have a badass product you can stand by that and i think you don't lose plus they're not like totally. a super low cost 
product. So they're cause consumers are people who want quality and service. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not going to get that. Yeah, like, like I don't want my money back. I want another pair. I love those. Yeah, I exactly. have like four pair already, and this is the first pair that this has happened yeah, yeah, yeah. to. And so I'm not like interested in, oh, give me my fucking $80 back or whatever. It's like, hey, give me another pair, please. Oh, <laughs> oh, so, I got to tell you yeah. guys a funny story. So you know how we all got Disney Plus, right? So now I've got access to all these uh, Disney cartoons. My daughter's like freaking out. Oh, I know. Out. Isn't that great? Yeah, she's freaking out, right? But did you guys know, by the way, side note, that on the old cartoons, when you pull them up on Disney Plus, they'll have like a little... Warning at the top, like this. This has um, <laughs> this has out- smoking cigars and, and says It'll like say weird like language, outdated like, yeah. gender, uh, you know, uh, stereotypes or oh, whatever. See- I didn't see that. Yes, it'll no, say shit like that. Really? What? Yes. Well, I've told you what all these new, the new oh, Disney, how they've changed weird. some of the songs and the, when they remade them and stuff like that. So we're watching uh, Lady in the Tramp. Do you guys remember that one? Yeah, yeah I just yeah, watched yeah. that. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I love Lady in the Tramp. I was kind of like watching. Which, it. It by the bad. way, okay, it's the most stereotype Italian people of all time in that movie <laughs> come on they, when he when he go get he gets the pasta yeah. and he's eating with the you know with the lady or whatever i'm like oh my yeah. god but anyway yeah. Yeah. But, but anyway that that uh that's cartoon really that's really good bro that's not that, bad at thanks, all thanks. that I'm cartoon was made in 1956 or something like that so it's, wow. a, it's an old one wow. it's an old one so in it's like the, one of the original 10 then, right? Yeah. So in there, I'm watching it with uh, my daughter and with Jessica, and it's great. I used to watch it when I was a kid. And there's the scene where the lady's uh, owners, the, 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 the woman or whatever, becomes pregnant. And so then ladies in the, you know, and there's all these, they're, they're having like a baby shower. So they have all the women in one room and they're like, oh my God, you're so radiant. You're so beautiful. You look so gorgeous right now. Mm-hmm. And then lady walks into the men where the men are. And like, you've never looked worse. You look fucking terrible. Like they're talking shit to him. And I'm laughing because it highlights such a, that is such a clear example of the differences between men and women. Yeah. Men and women are so different with how we, yeah. they like we talk to each other. Like, why do we fuck with each other so bad? <laughs> yeah. you know I, mean? I don't know, but that's just how it is. The other one that, the other thing that was funny was uh, uh, pimples. Um, when you have a pimple on your body, what does your girl do? Oh yeah. I was talking about this morning. I have one that's like festering right now. I was like doing squats. <laughs> so, so gross. I'm just going to, I'm going to be all out in the open with this. I, apparently this is off limits, I guess. But um, yeah, dude, I, I put like the bar on there and it's just like, oh, it's irritated a little Ugh. bit more. And it's just been like this, this annoying thing. And, and of course, Courtney like, like spots it like, oh, like a heat seeking missile, you know, and, like comes and like starts like touch it. I'm like, don't touch it. Let it go through the process of becoming a mountain. <laughs> and then we we attack it. Oh. You attack it too early, dude. Oh. It, it ruins it. Jessica tries to find things on my body she can squeeze, oh. and, and I don't get it. I do you guys yeah. ever have an urge to do that on anybody no. else? No, no it's no, disgusting. No, 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 no. That is such a, a, a female yeah. thing. Yeah. It's a hundred percent. Don't they're, they have like Instagram pages like dedicated to that? Millions of views, like not like almost like a bit like. There's so many views. Like yes. it has its own TV show now, Doctor Pimple Popper. Yes. What? Yes, yeah, she has her own TV show of just like, yeah, you know, like oh, okay, and this one. Yep, I know? cannot That's even. All it is. I Ooh. can't even think about watching something like that. It makes me want to throw up. Jessica will watch it for hours. Yeah, it's like her favorite thing. I'm like, what are you looking at? She's like, it's so satisfying. I'm like, it's disgusting. That is, that is weird. To <laughs> I me. feel like she's like, it's like, uh, you know, like we evolve from like monkeys. You know what I mean? She uh, just want to like. That's the most they clear groom example. Us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Totally. What, what, is it, what is it about uh, us that we do that they think the same way? Because that's something that I'm like ugh, repulsed by. Oh, that guys do that uh, yeah, they don't? Yeah, that we do that's just weird like just, that. I don't know. I mean. Just sitting on the couch and like putting your hand down, you know, and scratching yourself. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Al Bundy style. I do that a lot. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't even mean to. Just, just hold your crotch. Yeah. 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 Well, here's a good one is uh, you, you ever have your girl tell you like, you're like, hey, where's the mayonnaise? Oh, it's in the fridge. And you open the fridge and you just look. Yeah. You don't, and you don't oh, see yeah. it. You yeah. scan. You're like, it's not in there. Yeah. And then she comes over and she moves things yeah. and it's in the back. Yeah. And, like, and she's like, you never move anything. This or, happens. Or it's right in front of your face and I yeah. didn't see it at This all. happens so many times to me that I'm like, why do, and it's like, a, it's like a stereotype, right? That men can't find something in the yeah. woman. I'm like, why do we do that? Why are we? Why does that stereotype exist? And here's my theory. My theory is that when you know, because we're you know we're hunters, right? When we're looking at things visually, we don't want to disturb or make any noise, so we just look. If we don't see it, it's not there. Yeah, yeah. There, since they were the gatherers, they're moving things and finding the the you know the stuff. So, <laughs> and she's like, why don't you move things? And it doesn't cross my mind 
to yeah. put my hand in the fridge. Well, and, it's not moving. Yeah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I can't see it. Yeah, you know, it needs to move. I have to have my spear ready to throw yeah. the mayonnaise. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. not in there. I don't uh, know what's going on. I think that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, yeah. did you, uh, you guys know how Butcher Box has heritage pork? Do you guys know what heritage pork is? No. Uh, you guys know what this is? No, so no. It's old, no. like old bacon. So I said, so I, <laughs> so I did some, I did some reading about this. I'm not a huge pork guy. Do you guys, do you guys like pork? Yeah. I like bacon. I mean, bacon's the big one, right? I, I'm not a huge, generally you know yeah i mean yeah i'll be honest i mean i'll eat it occasionally well but. i told you we've been doing the pork shoulder in the in the um crock pot and I, we were doing that for a hot minute i was That's, doing that with the protein rice for mm -hmm. uh, to a point where i was like okay it's enough we were having it like every week for at least a few months yeah there. we'll do chops every now and then that's good yeah that's uh, that's true actually adam i, I was going to start doing that yeah, but anyway no. heritage pork is raised very very differently they are allowed to roam freely um, they don't produce nearly as much waste. Uh, they're, they're produced much more humanely. You, they use either way less antibiotics or no antibiotics. Essentially, heritage pork is the healthy version uh, or the, a much healthier version of uh, regular pork. Like the animal itself is much healthier. It's not the factory farming where they keep them contained and they produce shit tons of waste and they make them fat real quick or whatever. It's just a much better animal. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I didn't know the difference. I so didn't know there was a name for that. It's called heritage yeah. pork, yeah. If you look it up. Will they label that on like most, on on in like grocery stores will you see that? Do you know? If you go to the if you go to uh, a, a, a grocery store, if it says heritage pork, then that's what it is. If it doesn't, then huh. it's not. So the, But it's, it's raised far more humanely and allowed to roam. And they, it's much better for the environment because the waste that they produced is spread out over all the land or whatever. Mm -hmm, it's yeah. just a much better, you know, animal or whatever. So um, good, it's good. So I was looking that up, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start ordering more. Normally, I'm not a huge pork consumer, but I'm yeah, have more of it now. Well, we bought a, a pig a long time ago. Like from, they went through the whole process of uh, what do they call that club, um, where you know they. They raise animals and then all the way to where FHA the, or, or uh, um, uh, what's the not other one? FHA uh, FFA is it Future Farmers of America? It's like that, but it's, right? yeah, that's not <laughs> what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. you get what I'm going, but yeah, yeah that like so this family raised and then presented it and, and won awards with it and everything. It was like award winning pig, and then uh, so we got to 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 eat it after. But you knew the people personally, and you knew that they took care of it like it was like yeah, their that, own. That's FFA, isn't is it? That what it is? I I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And Google, that's Google that's that where you, is that where you go in with my other... farm knowledge is lacking. Mm -hmm. I know. I I feel like I should know this, and I uh, I'm hoping that I'm, I'm my right. Yeah, you were on yeah. farms, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, what he's asking though is so like out of my out of my wheelhouse. Here. You were, I wasn't a big pig guy. You're a yeah. cow expert. Yeah. yeah, cow, yeah. You're raising yeah. Uh, prize pigs, huh? Yeah. yeah. Cow, yeah. Cows and almonds and chickens. You yeah. Know? yeah. So yeah. that's what, squeezing them out. Hey, too. did you guys uh, see the update on the whole Epstein? You know, he's alive. Thing. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be the committed suicide. Twist. Again. <laughs> yeah, no. The guards that were in charge. I got to pull it up, dude, because this is actually kind of crazy. The guards that were in charge of, uh, you know, supposedly they all have amnesia. Supposed to check on them. Four H Club. No, to check this out, dude. Sorry, I just came. So out. they got bro yeah. They got brought in yeah. for <laughs> the what? The Four H Club. Yeah, Four H Club. Yeah. That's that's who raised the the pig, and that that's a thing where they present oh, animals okay. and get rewards. It just popped back up. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, so that's how my brain works. Back now. to Epstein. <laughs> uh, so they the guards got called in t t for investigation because Epstein was he was supposed to be watched, and it's almost impossible to commit suicide in in this situation. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but they don't... They, yeah, they should, they're like checking. They're supposed to be checking. Not on only do like, they check you, but the sheets that you have on your bed are almost uh, the consistency of paper, so you can't hang yourself with it. Uh, they don't give you any utensils or anything like that or because they know people try to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But yet he did, and nobody checked, and so they investigated the guards. Well, check this out. They've been... They've been brought... They've been indicted on federal charges. Oh, wow. So check this out. Here they, it comes. They ignored more than 75 mandatory checks. 75? 75 mandatory checks. Then they fabricated records to cover it up. Oh, wow. This whole thing, like, if how can you not think this, this is like a conspiracy? Yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? Is it's, there anybody who doesn't? Yeah. Is there there are people? There's actually people that are. Yeah, those people make arguments. I mean, arguments it's just like, like, is it actually going to make its way to court and people, you know, get busted for this, or is this just going to be like, yeah, we all know it happened. It's almost like you know the whole OJ like trial thing where you like get yes. no result. You write a book about it later. Yeah, on. you write a book. I yeah. think that to be. I, if I true. did, you know, like <laughs> hit, kill myself or like pretend to, this is how it yeah. look. Anyway, we'll see if these guys commit suicide too. <laughs> you know what yeah, saying? right. Or all of a sudden, everybody has amnesia. Yeah. Oh. Dude, yeah. I I feel like what they're what they could potentially uncover is going to be so explosive that I don't know if people are even ready to hear it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, goes, it goes really far down. You know the the rabbit hole. Well, that's what the conspiracy theorists say. They say that it goes to all kinds of extremely powerful people. Mm-hmm. To you know the royal family in England, top politicians uh, in the U.S. on both sides of the aisle, celebrities. That you would think are you know great people like Oprah, uh, Tom Hanks, like crazy. Whoa, are you just throwing whoa, random names yeah, out there? Yeah, I was no. gonna say, like, how dare you? Tom Hanks played Mr. There. Rogers. Yeah. It comes I, out Thursday, bro. I've, Don't ruin it for me. No, no, no. I've heard. Again, these are conspiracy theorists that are saying that these people. Who knows? But uh, are they flat earther conspiracy theorists, or are they like you know? That's the thing with somewhat conspiracy. credible. Yeah, you yeah. never know, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, do you guys know what ban- panspermia? Do you guys know what panspermia is? Haven't yeah, you I do. Talked about it before? Yeah, or Justin it, brought it up before. I, I love it. It's like my favorite theory. Uh, yeah, where basically you're getting uh, like bacteria or life forms from you know wherever else in the universe that just like ride a comet and then hit the Earth and then it like it creates. Uh, like diversity of life that way. Yeah. So the theory is that that meteors seeded the Earth. That's why it's panspermia. Okay. Seeded the Earth with the building blocks for life. Or some people will take it a step further and say that the meteors themselves brought life uh, to Earth, mm-hmm. and that's how Earth, uh, you know, got the start with life. But we didn't. We don't really have. Uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of evidence supporting this. It was just a theory. Well, researchers recently found the first direct evidence that this may actually be the case. They found ribose. Ribose is a, a, a sugar um, that is essential for the, for the production of RNA, which can lead to production of DNA. They found them on meteorites that have been that have landed or have hit Earth. So this is the first time they actually have evidence wow. that panspermia may actually be a real thing. Didn't we accidentally do that to Mars or uh, <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> yeah, like, like we accidentally oh whoops like added some like little microbe, you know, organisms well, that like made its way on Yeah, what Mars. are they called? Uh, they were bears, right? Yeah, little bear. Yes, you they remember. Were, they were little bears. They're called water bears, but yes. like, <laughs> water bears. The, the actual technical term is is something they, they grow yeah. up and get They look huge. like water they look like little bears. No, yeah. they don't look like bears. <laughs> they do too. No, they like don't. Little, little pig bears. <laughs> so they look good. Like, you got little short arms and they have big pu- pig, pig belly and they were called something bears. No, there's something. What's their name? Yeah, Maybe duck by pig Tardigrades. Bear aliens. Tardigrades. Uh, Tardigrades, yeah. That's a dumb name. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I, like I like pig bears. I like pig bears too. <laughs> you go to Mars, there's <laughs> little bears on there. Yeah. <laughs> what have we done? Uh, anyway. I blame you, Elon. What's this uh, What's this deal with uh, these? Have you guys seen this This like resurgence in amateur fighting on uh, like TV? And yeah, League? somebody, we just, remember we were just talking about yeah. that Uh uh, Bradley couple, Martin and uh, yeah, yeah, right. A couple episodes stuff. ago, and we were you were speculating on oh, it will die, and I was saying no, I don't think it will. I think it's becoming a thing where people are more interested in seeing these amateurs that are uh, famous people uh, fight each other. And after that conversation, somebody DM me and said that uh, Barstool Sports has like a you know a rough and rowdy like league that is amateur boxing. I think it's only like two or three rounds long. Yeah. And it's just they throw a couple of amateurs in, in there and they go at it and it's supposedly it's blowing up. It, wow. it, it's a it's a it'll it'll blow up and then it'll go away. Yeah. Just like it has before. Remember remember uh, tough, tough man, man contest. Yeah, yeah, tough yeah, man contest. About, you know when the UFC it, it first started when the UFC first started, that's what it was. Yeah. Right? The UFC was martial artists who were not professional fighters fighting in the cage. There were no rules. But in order for the UFC to really grow, it had to turn into what it is today with some rules uh, and become and have really really good fighters. The reason why I it I, loses its novelty. The dude. reason why I yeah. I argue with you on that is because we are in a different time now. Because and I wish I ha- I ha- I wish I had good analytics to debate this, but this, so this is just me speculating. But you know, your average professional boxing fight. You know how many people are are viewing that on HBO or sure. whatever they're right. I, it, it's probably in the 
low millions, wouldn't you say? If yeah. if millions on like a like a, a, a like a low level professional fight on HBO or whatever. I don't know. I'm just guessing, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're somebody like a Logan Paul or one of these guys who've got 10 million plus followers that are following you, you have access to an audience that is already interested in who you are, regardless that you might fight somebody. Mm-hmm. And we all know that just as humans, that the drama and all that we we, we are will gravitate towards. So we've never had this before. You've never had a a, 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 a boxer be have that type, big of a network before they became a famous boxer. So it's kind of like reverse now. And so it makes me go, will it? Because maybe these people are so famous that they already have a network of people that want to see them do anything. Yeah, they want to see them squeeze lemons in their eyes. They want to see them do fucking... Yeah, yeah but the know. novelty's gone. Once they do the fight and you see them do the fight, unless they're good... The novelty really? wears off. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, it's... Uh, like, bro, watch a celebrity... Okay, so let's say one of your top favorite celebrities. You're like, oh my God, it's... Uh, like Ar- Screech. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> he did that. Yeah, I know. He did I that. saw that fight. You'll watch it once or twice, but then if they suck, you're like, I'm not going to watch that again. They have to keep coming up with new ways of getting your attention. Now, here's the way that I think it might succeed is because of the internet and it doesn't require as much money to put the shit together. Right. So they may be just on the internet type of deal. There's not a lot of money behind it or whatever. Kimbo Slice kind of proved that model. Remember when he was doing his yeah, backyard, yeah. you know, fights or whatever. And right. so maybe like that, but I don't think it'll ever reach the levels of uh, or come close to. Yeah, to I'm wondering good about the the taboo, like sort of the political, you know, the PC culture and like cry closets and all that. If there's like underground like energy that that you know on these college campuses that they do want, like you know, some kind of Fight Club thing. I, yeah, I don't I, know, dude. I I, th- I think it's going to keep going. I really yeah. do. I don't. I don't think we're going to see it die off at all. I think we're we're ushering in a new time of what people want to see. And at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter if it's recognized by pay per view or a league and it's official. If it's making money, yeah. If it's making millions of dollars, it's proving that people are tuning in and watching, sure, and they yeah. want more. You keep going back to that wealth. It's yeah, producing. I mean, you're making so, you're making so a good point. If you're, I mean, what I where I agree with you is like nobody who's in the sport will ever respect it. You know, if you're somebody who's in the sport of boxing, you're like, fuck that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, you you won't watch it. You will find it's just, it probably disrespectful. You're overestimating the, the, the entertainment value of shitty fighters. Shitty fighters, for the most part, they're not fun to watch. They yeah, get tired. Sloppy. Sloppy. It yeah, gets I, brutal. I look at it more like this. I, I, You know, back to, I brought up before the, um, you know, Maury Povich and what's his face? Yeah, uh, Jerry Springer. Jerry Springer yeah. era. Yeah. I mean, those people that were fighting, no one's a professional in that. We're tuning in because it's drama. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It's drama and it's entertainment yeah. and people love watching car crashes. And so that's what I, they're going to tune in. And who better than someone your brother. who is already a celebrity oh, here he is. with another celebrity that are going at it i just i think that we're in a new time and people are yeah but people actually going to watch the fight itself well, look at you saw how how they looked like they sold it in it, arena yeah huh? but it's, bo- it's again i, I mean i think there's going to be a fad element to it i don't think it's going to be a big like you're not going to be able to make a league out of it listen it's not i'm be- not, i'm not defending it because i think it's fucking cool and i like it or i watch it but i mean amateur a, fights a, are boring there's a lot dude. of things that are fun. Yeah. there's i was just talking to my cousin the other day who's got you know who's like making me privy to um, uh, what's the what's the streaming uh, thing that Gary V always talks about that everyone's Twitch. Twitch oh, are you familiar with Twitch and how that my, all? Works? My son will uh, watch video gamers on there. And right. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, would you ever have thought if I told you that people would pay money to sit and watch another kid play video games? If I told you that a decade ago, would you? I, yeah, I was confused by that, but then I remembered when I was a kid, I loved watching my friend's older brother play. Because he was awesome at it, you right. know, and you're just sitting there, whoa, like that's the potential and of what you could do. With so it. to that point, I look at this like today's modern Jerry Springer, the same fucking people mm-hmm. that would stare and watch fucking Jerry Springer at 11 o'clock at night every single night, at whatever. Those same people now are watching or those type of people, the things that they like like that are watching these celebrity people you know, duke it out and talk shit. And if you want to look at a market that plays with that a lot, go to look at the Russian uh, fighting market. I love them. They have uh, this is for real. They now. fight with like swords. But this is for fucking re- crazy. They have gang fights. Yeah. So the, in the cage, it'll be five against five, 
They have, uh, uh, like what Justin's saying, weapons fights. They're in yeah. there with swords and armor. Have you seen the ones where they like have boxes and, and like things like platforms that they could step up on and then they still fight like yep. on levels? Yep. It's they have, like, what are we doing? They have arm wrestling matches where you can arm wrestle and you either beat the guy by, by beating him in arm wrestling or you can knock him out. So were they're they punching the ones that I saw somebody on it, Instagram tagged me on like uh, where these guys were boxing and you were tied to another person. Yes. So yeah. our, our backs were tied to each other <laughs> and we're like a team. And we're fighting another yes. two guys that are like yes. tied together. I yes. thought that was fucking That's hilarious. Ridiculous. But it's, okay, but it's novelty. I it's novelty. I so I love fight sports, and I watched the gang one. I was like four against four. I'm like, this is gonna be fucking awesome. <laughs> it's not awesome because here's what happens. Oh, it's ugly. One guy knocks another guy out, and then before you know it, it's two against one yeah, or three against one. Stomps on him, and then you don't want to yeah. watch anymore. Like this is terrible. Uh, I don't want to watch this, <laughs> this fucking thing anymore. <laughs> this is horrible. It's brutal, dude. First question is from Cam Web One. How long should you stay in a specific rep range? Should you be switching it up weekly, shorter, or longer? So, a uh, really common question. Now, one answer that I've heard often that I I can see the value in, but I also disagree slightly with, is to stick in a rep range until your body stops responding. I get the rationale behind that. There's some value to it, but here's why I tend to disagree with that. Once you hit a plateau in your training, getting out of a plateau can be a little bit of a of a difficult thing. Can well, kind of be a part. Not of to it, mention it's, not to mention it. It's like on a spectrum, right? So it's like when you hit the hard plateau, you were your progress was already starting to slow down. Yes, leading up to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. in the, in the perfect world, you know, and of course there's there's going to be an individual variance with everybody, right? With this, but in a perfect world, you're transitioning out of a rep range after you've peaked, right? You've peaked yes. and seen the max results from that rep range, and then you're transitioning to another rep. Before rep, the plateau. Yeah, before, well before the plateau even, right? Yep. And so you're probably trying to – you want to land somewhere between plateau time and peak and somewhere in there. And that's why we've we've geared most of our programs in that three- to four-week range. And you know, some studies will show that it's – up to six weeks where people are seeing phenomenal results from a rep range or a a program before they have to transition out. But we find that kind of sweet spot. And it's, of course, again, there's- The challenge there is the mental discipline part of it. Like to be able to then transition before, right as you're feeling like you're just in the groove, like you do hit that- Absolutely. You do hit that peak, you know, and it, it's contagious. You know? uh, it's I like, would I'm say- I'm good at this now. Well, wouldn't you guys say that this is, uh, we do this all the time. We And we admittedly say this. Totally. Like getting stuck in a, in a phase where- you know, you're getting strong and you hit a PR and it's like, oh, next week I want to do it again. Oh, my God, I'm seeing more strength gains. And you get addicted to that. And more often than not, we probably stay in rep ranges longer than we should, especially when we know that sweet spot is somewhere between that three to six week range. Oh, yeah. yeah. You can get addicted to the to the sweat and the pump that you get from high reps or supersets. You can get addicted to the strength uh, that you get from the, the low reps. Um, you know, I tend to get stuck in the low rep range, but for in my experience working with most people, I would say around three weeks typically yeah. is when you'd want to switch. It's now, around three weeks. I think it's important though that we, we talk about what the studies show and then why we recommend that way because the studies will show that it's it's almost exactly the same. Somebody who phases every three to six weeks versus somebody who is changing every single day. Yeah. So like Monday, low reps, Wednesday, you know, higher reps versus... Uh, somebody who goes low reps for three weeks and then switches to high reps. Right. For three so the weeks. studies will show that those two people are about the same. Yes. There's not much of a difference. So um, that that's what we know, and that's where someone will come back and be like, "Oh, the studies show this." Well, here's that's true. But what I have found training so many people for so long is that when you do that, it's really hard to see what you're getting the best responses to. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. Why I tease it out. why I like block training. Okay. And, and doing it that way is staying consistent with it for a little bit gives us enough time to kind of like, oh, okay, wow, I noticed I, when I transitioned to this rep range, I've seen all these benefits. And it's easier for you to attach things to a way of training for your body. I think it just gives you – it's better data for you to get feedback and learn about your body and how it responds to ways of training versus – you know, muscle confusion, you know, theory of just throwing different exercises, different rep ranges all the time. Every week you're, you're constantly, you know, quote unquote, confusing the body. And what ends up happening is, okay, sure. You see good results, fat loss and muscle building over the course of six months, 
But then if you ask that person, well, you know, what do you benefit the most from is do you benefit the most from low rep ranges, high rep ranges, or do you notice that you get inflammation when you train this way? Or do you notice you get achy joints when you train that way? Or, you know, they can't answer that because they have so much inconsistency with the way that they train that they they have a hard time isolating uh, how their body is responding. Yes. And now the other reason why I support the blocks is because the there's a different mental space that goes into training in different rep ranges. Like if I'm going to the gym and I'm training in the the four or five right, a good point rep too. range with longer rest periods, it's 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 a different uh, mental state. I'm going in there lift heavy. I'm my rest periods are longer. I'm not focused on the pump. I really don't care about that. It's about moving the weight. It's not as much about feeling the muscle as much as it is perfecting the form and maximizing, you know, my leverage and biomechanics uh, to get the most weight up. High reps, I'm going in there. I'm not – don't give a shit about how much weight I'm lifting. I'm about feeling the muscle, getting the pump. I'm keeping my heart rate up. It's a completely different feel. And when I've trained clients, i found that if I keep them in a block – it gets them to do a better job training in that rep Such range. Such a good because point. Because they're consistent with it. Such they, a good point. They get really good at low rep training. They get to practice all the elements of training besides the reps themselves. It's that that state of mind that they get to practice more consistently. Yeah. Um, and so it just has more value for most people. Now, if you're advanced, like if you've been training for a long time and you're super advanced, that's fine. You can train, change your rep ranges, uh, you know, each workout, and you're probably okay because you know your body. You know, but most people aren't like that. Most people are beginner to intermediate. Most people mm -hmm. are not in that unconscious competent stage. In which case, I would say stay in the rep range for you know three, four weeks, and then move out. And, and each time you're in there, get really good at that rep range, and then move to the next one and practice that one and get really good at that one. Next question is from Danny Girl. I am confused about the whole bulk and cut thing. Can I cut calories and still gain muscle? Okay, so uh, so here's the thing with, with, with calories. Think, think about it this way. Calories are, okay, so if I'm trying to build a house, mm -hmm. um, I first have to- You need the material. Yeah, the I, materials. Yeah, <laughs> I have to, the I, wood, the concrete, you know, all the stuff. That's it. So I have to have, I have to first off have the plans or order the house to be built. There's the signal. We got to build this house. I'm going to need the workers. They're the ones that are going to be piecing the house together. So that's the capability uh, to build the house. But then I need the building blocks. If I have the workers in the order, but I have no cement, I have no bricks, I have no wood, I have no nothing, um, the house isn't going to get built. Those so your calories. So when you're building your body, you need the signal, which is the resistance training or the workout that sends the signal. That's like the order to start building. Then you need the workers. That's your body's ability to build muscle, uh, and that comes from, uh, you know, the appropriate was the signal appropriate? Did I overdo it? Did I underdo it? Am I getting good sleep? All that stuff. But then I need the building blocks, and that's the calories. That's the proteins and the carbohydrates and the fats, which all play a role in building your body. So if you're trying to build muscle, you probably are going to need more calories than you need to just stay the same. That's what bulking is. You're just you're 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 giving your body more building blocks mm -hmm. to build muscle, and more means above what it takes for your body to stay the same. Now, is it possible to eat less calories and still build muscle? It, it is, but it's also very unlikely. But it is possible, and it's through what's called calorie repartitioning. So, what that basically means is, if my calories are low, my body's going to burn or take some building blocks from my body fat. And then use that for building muscle or help that that's going to help the process. And we of see this muscle. most often if we do see it in newbies. Yeah. yeah. Somebody who's never touched so weights. It's like the or, Goldilocks window. Right. You've never touched weights. Or even if you're somebody who's trained before, but you haven't trained for the last six months to a year and you've been off and then you get back in the gym. We tend to see this during this time period, but then quickly your body adapts and then you don't see those. And you need it's un, it's unfortunate that we we use terms like bulk and cut because bulk sounds so yeah, unattractive it does or, bulk yeah. sounds so unattractive for a client who comes to me and says adam i want to reduce body fat and build some muscle but i care i don't want to bulk up right because yeah. that's normally the follow-up statement to yeah i want to be tight and firm and i want to build muscle adam um but i don't want to bulk up like how many cl female clients have told you that before sitting in oh, front yeah. of you and then you have to explain 
what building muscle. I blame the marketing. I mean, especially for a lot of these cardiovascular machines that they're out there saying like, you're going to lose weight and build muscle. And you're just like, wait a minute. Like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, like we have to decipher what goal it is you're specifically trying to accomplish first. And then, you know, like proceed to the, to the next, right. You know, you're not going to have them both simultaneously. Like they're, they're two opposing, uh, you know, animals there that we're trying to do. Now cutting is the opposite. Cutting is consuming less calories than your body's burning. So you think to yourself, well, how can my body burn more calories than I'm eating? Where is it getting the, the energy to sustain itself if I'm not consuming enough to sustain itself? Well, your body gets it from its stored energy, which is your body fat. So your body will not go into its stores of body fat unless you're consuming less calories, uh, unless your body thinks it needs to, unless you're consuming less calories then you're burning. If you're not doing that, if I'm consuming as many calories as I'm burning or more, it'll just use the calories. Yeah, my body has no has no reason to go in. It's like it's like this. Look, if you're, would you tap into your savings account if you're making weight, you're making enough money to to sustain yourself? There's no need to tap into my bank account. I got cash in my wallet all the time. There's absolutely no need. Well, that's what your body is doing. So, cutting is the process of eating less calories than your body's burning. Bulking is the process of eating more calories than your body's burning. Now we've gone into the details because you could do them both wrong. You could go, you could bulk with too many calories or cut too many calories. And there's lots of strategies on how to maximize the benefits and minimize the, you know, the detriments of, of doing either one. But, uh, you know, what we're talking about now is kind of giving you that, that general overall idea uh, of what they mean. So the second part was, can I cut calories and still gain muscle? Yes, it's ha it can happen. Very, very difficult and very unlikely, though. So I wouldn't mm. aim for that. Next question is from SS Turley. What is the best way to strengthen wrists? I'm looking to learn a handstand, but my wrists give out first. So so strengthening wrists in the context of this question, which is uh, my wrists hurt when I'm doing... Because when you're doing a handstand or push-ups, I've had a lot of clients who talk about how it hurts their wrist or they do yoga yeah. because they're in that like extended, yep. you know, position or whatever. And then they're now applying all this excess of uh, pressure and load. It is. And so it's, this is, strength is a piece of it. Um, but to be more uh, specific, this is mobility. Mm -hmm. This has more to do with your wrist mobility. Um, and there's excellent exercises that you could do to improve the connective, the connection to your, your, your wrist range of motion so that you're not relying on the joint. Well, Maps you know Prime Pro addresses this. We, oh, we address even the wrist. I mean, we go through every major joint in the body, and the I actually teach those wrist, wrist exercises that are in Prime Pro to a lot of my clients. A lot of clients that you know sit at desks or on computers, and that when you're in this fixed position and you're typing on a keyboard all day, mm -hmm. you tend to lose that that good mobility in your wrist, especially if you don't use it or do things like Indian clubs or mace swings or stuff like that that kind of challenge your wrist mobility. And you get older, and you've been doing that for years. So it's a and and what ends up happening to a lot of people, they lose the mobility in their wrist, and then it ends up being forearm, elbow pain, and it radiates all the way up their mm -hmm. body. So doing some of those mobility exercises, I don't know if we've done any of that on our YouTube channel. I'm trying to think right now. I don't think we've done wrists. Yeah, I think that would be a great one to uh, yeah, yeah maybe make a note. Maybe make a note, Doug. We'll do some well, mobility. Well, one, one um, movement that I really like that we put in Maps OCR. Um, because OCR, obstacle course racing, um, lots and lots of, you oh, need lots of hand strength. And wrist work, yeah, yes. like crazy. There's uh, a rice bucket uh, yeah. movement that I think is phenomenal. It's really easy. I can explain it on the podcast. You probably don't even need me to show you, but you get a bucket, um, fill it with rice, stick your hand inside there, and open and close open your, your hand. Fingers, and, yeah. grab some, like smash it down there real good. It's great because it gives you, it provides natural like resistance through the rice. And that's just, just enough to get your, your stabilizing muscles to stimulate, you know, around your hand it, and wrist. It is. Now, here, and here's another tip. Um, I remember reading this uh, years ago uh, about push-ups. I went through this whole, this, this stint where I wanted to get really, really good uh, at push-ups. And it would it would start to bother my wrist, and so what I would have to do is either grip on handles or use get on my fists so that my wrist didn't hurt. I don't want to do that. I'm like, I want to be able to go on my palms. So I was doing some reading, and martial artists who you know do lots and lots of push-ups have some phenomenal techniques at preventing wrist pain when you're in that position. And one of the things you can do, and it's it's so brilliant and so silly. I wish I learned this earlier. Was while you're in that position, 
try to grip the floor. Yeah. No joke. Like pretend like you're gripping the floor and what you're doing is you're activating the muscles that support your wrist so that you're not just resting on the or, joint on the right. joint itself. Yeah. So you just and you're not you're obviously you're not going to grip the floor because you can't, mm. but you just pretend like right. you are gripping that the floor. and you're actually like trying to push and turn a little bit that added a little bit of rotation there through the elbow a lot of times too helps to activate even more uh, stimulus of uh, support system. Yeah, it's like turning a uh, like turning two knobs right. while you're gripping the floor and you'll find that you'll actually get stronger at your push-ups or handstands. And you'll get less pain. And that's why I always speak to rotation. And the and uh, FRC does a good job of this too. They're controlled articulating rotational movements for the joint because we're not expressing that all the time. That is a great way to stimulate more of a of a of a supported uh, stabilization mechanism. We, we we're losing that by not expressing that movement. Next question is from Flaw4581. If you could prescribe one physical activity or exercise to be done two to three times a week for the average person, what would it be? Walking. Yeah. Well, two to three times a week if you prescribe just one. Just one thing? Yeah. Resistance training. It's got to, it's got to wins. Well, hands down. Yeah. Absolutely hands down. Now, it, it, now here's why uh, – now, I know where you're going with walking. I think that's a fundamental right. uh, movement that's uh, – and it's easy. It's easy for people to do. Right, right. I mean, if I have somebody who knows how to barbell squat, mm -hmm. then I would love to see you barbell squat two to three times a day because you get – it pretty much hits everything from head to toe. And if you're only going to do one movement, that would be ideal. But – if somebody is uh, completely sedentary, I'm trying to get them to do something, they're doing nothing, and I, if I could get them to do one piece of physical activity, I would normally start with walking. Yeah, it's got, the, it's got the, the, the shortest learning curve. Right. Most people still know how to do it. Um, it there's less. You don't need to teach people. Uh, there's not a lot of instruction involved. Now, that all being said, if, if we were to pick a physical activity that people actually learned and did appropriately, um, resistance training – Hands down, hands down, there is no form of exercise that comes close to resistance training in, in terms of, uh, you know, directly combating the problems that we encounter with modern life, uh, hands down. So think about it this way, right? Uh, modern life, super busy, uh, but sedentary as hell. Uh, but we're also super busy. So two to three days a week, realistically, you know, and I, this is something I try to communicate to, to fitness experts and influencers all the time is I know the ideal thing is to communicate to people to work out all day long and every day or whatever. But the reality and I've known I've learned through training lots and lots of people, most people are going to make at best, if you're lucky, about two or three days a week uh, to, to work out. If you're lucky, most people are, are closer to two days a week, three days a week if they're really dedicated. And so working within that, you want something that speeds up the metabolism so that they can eat more food because there's a lot of food all the way all around. You want something that's extremely individual, individualized. And there's nothing that's more individualized than resistance training. You can lift weights or use resistance regardless of how tall or short you are or any of your disabilities or movement patterns. It can be applied to your body as an individual. Well, there'd be a, I, I, there'd be a ton of tremendous benefit if we're like being so specific where it's like one physical activity or one movement or one thing that we'd right. have them do. like. Man, I would love to. I would pick something like a Turkish get up, a barbell back squat, and like, yet your goal is to perfect that, and everything you do is to get better at that. So you're either doing that exact movement, yeah. or you're working on stretches and mobility work to get you better at doing that movement. And that single thing alone uh, would. Well, there's serve so many different so many components people. to that, which I would totally agree. Like yeah. something like that, you you. You learn uh, your body on a, on a different level by like expressing all different types of movements in the lower extremities, the upper extremities, like how to stabilize, how to move, how to not rotate, how to rotate. So, yeah, something like that where it's it's more of an educational body awareness type of a, an exercise. If you could only do one, and you could keep loading it more. Right. Uh, but I mean, because I was even thinking in my head, I'm like, man, what? What? Just one exercise? I mean, like. I was even thinking it's like like climbing, you know, something where I'm getting the whole body involved and there's a lot more variables to what I'm doing and challenging the body on, on multiple levels. Yeah, as far as, you know, I'll stick more to the physical activity versus right. just an exercise. And I'll, I'll just say, I mean, resistance training, it's, it's got to be the absolute best thing you do. Sure. Now, here's the thing about walking that I like. Walking can be incorporated into every day. 
um, not just two or three days a week because you don't have to necessarily schedule an hour long walk. You can do 10, 15 minute walk every couple hours. Right. You know, if when you're at work, um, the, the, the most success I ever had with clients was long term was getting them to lift weights two to three days a week and to just the, inc- incorporate daily walking into their, their, their lives. It's a, it's a really simple yet difficult question to answer because so much of this also depends on who I'm speaking to. Yeah, 100%. Because another point that I'm th- that's coming to mind right now as we're all throwing out random shit right now is the thing that my client is going to do consistently is it supersedes everything else too. So, for example- oh, Like if they hate something versus- Right, right. Like, like let's say I have a client that like loves swimming. And swimming is phenomenal. And they they have terrible mechanics when they you know, squat and, and do resistance training. They don't like being outdoors and walking, but they love the pool. And I can only get three, three, three days a week of physical activity, like fucking swim. I mean, I would want them to swim. So it, it really depends on who I'm talking to, how I would answer this question. But I'm, I'm thinking about all those, those these variables that would make a difference in how I would, you know, direct this person. I think Sal brings up a great point that nothing is going to be better than a customized resistance training program for an individual. You're going to get the most benefit for your metabolism, for your heart, for your health, for your strength, for your protection of your bones, for your body fat. Like, I mean, just that encompasses everything if you, if you've designed something ideal for them. But if they're not going to stick with it, they're not going to do it. And but they would swim. Then that's a good point. You know, because, so all those things matter. Yeah, because rule number one is physical activity is better than no physical activity. And so if you know you tell your you could you could sell somebody all day long on a form of exercise, and if they just don't like it, they're not going to do it. It's worthless. Right. It's absolutely absolutely worthless. So something is better than nothing. But if you can sell someone and you can get them to enjoy whatever form of physical activity. Um, then resistance training becomes uh, the best one. And this is something that I've, I've, I constantly am trying to make this case and sell. And part of the reason why I think people don't try resistance training is less because they don't like it and more because of the misconceptions around it. I really do. I think when you talk to every day, you know, you know Jane and Joe, um, uh, and you say, and they say, oh, I want to start working out. What should I do? I want to start you know, being active. What should I do? And I say, lift weights. They automatically think, Bodybuilder, strength athlete. Oh, I don't want to build. I don't care about building. I think it's the common. I think it's a combination of that and the difficulty, the learning curve of it. Yeah. If you've never uh, squatted, if you've never squatted or deadlifted or overhead pressed before or done a movement like that, it's probably seems really intimidating. Most humans at one point in their life ran, walk, or swam. You know, growing up as a child, Mm -hmm. and so there's there's they're familiar with that. Um, doing something that is completely new and foreign to them can probably seem very intimidating. And then you tack on your point that you're making that there's a lot of misconceptions around it. It just makes it go like, oh, fuck that. I'll just stick to something I know and is easy. And so people avoid it. But the reality of it is um, it is the best thing that somebody can do. And then just the pursuit of learning that, there's so much value in that. So uh, you're right, resistance training, a customized program for that person, but there are other variables that you have. If you're a trainer asking this question, that you have to you have to take into consideration who you're talking totally. to. Totally. Now go to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free resources, guides, and free programs. If you go on there, you can find stuff on burning body fat, building muscle, personal training, and more. You can also find the three of us uh, on social media. We're all on Instagram. Just the three of us. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.